Welcome to our policy consultation on religion and state after the Arab Spring. I'm Tom Farr, director of the Religious Freedom Project at Georgetown's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Um, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Tim Shaw, who is the associate director of the Religious Freedom Project in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our project. <clears throat> this is the first of a series of uh, policy meetings that we're going to be having over the next oh, year and a half. The project itself uh, is funded by the John Templeton Foundation. We began last year. Our goal is fairly simple stated, simply stated. It is to increase attention to the subject of religious freedom by scholars, uh, by the secular media, and to come to the point of today's meeting by policy experts and policy makers. Um, we think religious freedom is important. It, the premise of the project is that it's important to individuals and individual flourishing. But uh, I think more importantly for this group, it's important, we believe, we think the evidence supports the proposition that's important for societies, for democratic stability, for undermining religious persecution, religious violence, religion-based extremism and terrorism. Uh, <clears throat> but we realize those are contested propositions. Uh, we think there's a lot of very interesting and exciting data to support them. But our goal today is to focus on uh, one aspect of the issue, which you're going to hear about in a few minutes. Some of you have already read about it, uh, uh, with Al Stepan's concept of the twin tolerations, and we're going to focus on Tunisia and the Arab Spring. But more broadly, we believe this is an issue that warrants greater policy scrutiny. And I'm delighted to see that we have representatives from all branches of government except possibly the Supreme Court. Uh, we certainly, and I don't, you know, if there are any justices here, please identify yourself. Uh, we certainly have uh, uh, a, we're well represented by the uh, policy think tank community uh, and by uh, the various branches uh, or the various agencies within the executive branch. So welcome to you all. Um, let me say that we have provided some materials for you, uh, which if you haven't picked them up, you're welcome to uh, before you leave. I believe they're out on the, the table at the far end where you came in. Um, a brochure, which will tell you more about our project. One way that we dissimulate, disseminate, disseminate, we don't dissimulate, I hope, <laughs> but we do disseminate our ideas through a team of outstanding uh, and international scholars. Uh, from the United States, Canada, uh, from uh, England and Scotland, uh, interdisciplinary scholars and policy experts, some of whom are here with us today, and you'll meet them in just a minute. Uh, there's also in the brochure that tells you about our scholars, it'll tell you about our targeted areas uh, for uh, religious freedom scrutiny. It'll also tell you about some of the things we've done and some of the things we're going to do. We, we have an exciting and uh, building website uh, I believe up already or about to be up are, uh, is a, is a several videos from a conference we just had last month in Oxford, England uh, on an important aspect of religious freedom. So um, if I might just say, uh, oh, a couple of other things about the, uh, the materials that are presented out there to you. Uh, there's a brief sampling of uh, the work of some of our scholars, sort of policy-oriented stuff. Um, I myself was fortunate enough to be a Foreign Service officer for 21 years, and I served in the Office of International Religious Freedom in the State Department. And out of that came a book, which is uh, displayed out there. Uh, please don't don't uh, steal it, but do buy it. Um, called "World of Faith of, and Freedom: Why Religious Liberty Is Vital to American National Interests." The title, the subtitle, tells you what my argument is. There are a couple of other policy-related pamphlets, which you can download from our website. One is the report of the Chicago World Affairs Council report on religion and U.S. foreign policy, which has a robust set of recommendations regarding religious freedom. Another is a, uh, uh, a set of recommendations that Dennis Hoover and I did for the Obama administration back at the beginning of the administration. And uh, yet another is a, a, an edited uh, series of essays by our uh, featured speaker today, I'll step on, and to his right, Tim Shaw, uh, to whom I'm going to turn this over in one minute. First, if I might, just say a word about I'll step on myself. Uh, Tim will introduce him, but 
Uh, I hope Al is getting visibly nervous over there right now. Um, I encountered the work of uh, Columbia political theorist Al Stepan about 12 or 13 years ago when I read what I thought was then, and I'm even more convinced now, was a seminal article in the Journal of Democracy entitled The Twin Tolerations, um, which he's going to tell you about, which he's updated and expanded. Um, I was so impressed by this way of thinking about, I was looking for a way to think about the issues of religion and state as a, as a practitioner at the time of foreign policy. And indeed, Al may or may not know it, but there's a section uh, in my own work on this entitled The Twin Tolerations, uh, how to, how to uh, take this model and implement it in American foreign policy. So with that, I'm going to turn this over with a welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. Tim, over to you. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you all very much for being here. And I want to thank our distinguished panel as well uh, in advance uh, for I, I, what I know will be uh, very interesting and relevant remarks. Uh, so welcome uh, to all of you to our policy consultation on rel religion and state after the Arab Spring, devising ground rules for a new era. We all recognize, of course, that a central important question that faces the world at this moment is the fate of the incipient emerging democratic transitions in North Africa and the Middle East in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about where these transitions are headed. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about what obstacles might remain uh, as these countries uh, uh, organize transitions towards stable and uh, uh, free uh, societies, towards democracy and towards stability. And yet often neglected in these conversations is the question of how exactly should religion and state interact and how should their relationship be organized, uh, given uh, the importance of having uh, free uh, and stable democracies. For many, many uh, years, theorists of democratization, of democratic transition in Western countries uh, have provided all kinds of uh, analyses concerning what makes for solid democratic transitions. Uh, how do you move from an authoritarian regime uh, through a democratic transition to a consolidated democratic regime? And yet many, many of these theorists have neglected uh, or ignored altogether uh, the question of how do you organize the relationship between religion and state in order to make sure that democratic transitions are as stable and as successful as they can be. There is uh, one theorist, one political scientist, who has not neglected uh, the question of how uh, religion should be dealt with, how uh, religion should relate to the state in organizing democratic transitions, and that is Alfred Stepan uh, to my left, uh, who is the keynote speaker uh, today. Uh, and who has thought a great deal about democratic transitions throughout the world, uh, in Latin America, in Eastern and Central Europe, uh, in South Asia, and now in the last uh, few years, uh, really last 10 years actually, he's thought a great deal about the question of democracy and Islam, and has focused a great deal of attention in the last 12 months uh, on the, the role of religion uh, in the democratic transitions uh, underway in North Africa and the Middle East. So we in the Religious Freedom Project at the Berkeley Center are, are keenly aware of uh, the, uh, this issue and are very interested in understanding how to organize uh, the relationship between religion and state in a way that secures democracy and stability. And to ask concretely, what ground rules should govern the relationship between religion and state in a way that will lay the foundations for uh, stable uh, democracy? And the way we understand religious freedom is, is in a broad sense, that religious freedom means not just freedom for individuals to worship uh, in private, but it also means freedom of organizations that are religious to organize themselves in civil society and also to advocate uh, on behalf of their uh, religious point of view in political society. Uh, and so we believe very strongly that it's important to ask how does religion and state, how do religion and state interact in order to create the foundations for democratic stability. And fortunately, we have Alfred Stepan here who has thought a great deal about this relationship. And so we're going to start with Professor Stepan, who's going to address uh, the following questions in his uh, remarks. One, what new religion state ground rules are emerging 
uh, in the countries that have been affected by the Arab Spring, especially Tunisia, that bode well for the democratic future of these societies. And how, do you, how does one explain the emergence of these new ground rules? Second question, what challenges remain that threaten the consolidation of full political and religious freedom in countries that have been affected by the Arab Spring, Tunisia uh, and others? Finally, what concrete lessons can we learn, uh, particularly those of us in the policy community, uh, as we consider transitions throughout the Arab Spring uh, that will help us achieve democratic stability uh, in the countries of North Africa and the Middle East? What concrete lessons can, for example, the Tunisian experience, which Professor Stepan will talk a great deal about, what concrete lessons can the Tunisian experience teach U.S. policymakers and political leaders in the region as they consider how to optimize uh, democratic stability in these societies? So Professor Stepan will speak uh, first, will speak to these questions, particularly focusing on the experience uh, of Tunisia. And then after Professor Stepan speaks, we'll hear from our other uh, distinguished uh, experts, uh, Daniel Philpot, uh, William Inboden, Tamara Witties, and then uh, uh, last but not least, my colleague uh, Tom Farr. I will not uh, provide lengthy introductions of these uh, panelists. You have their bios uh, in uh, your materials that you have uh, with you. Um, I'm going to ask that um, uh, uh, all of these uh, speakers uh, keep their remarks as brief as possible so that we can have as much time as possible for discussion with you in the audience. We're very delighted that, as Tom said, we have uh, people from all over the U.S. government, the policy community. I also want to uh, say uh, that we're delighted that we have Dr. Walid Faris uh, from um, the, um, uh, the presidential campaign of Mitt Romney, a special advisor and uh, co-chair of his Middle East advisory group. Uh, we have many, many other experts, uh, distinguished experts from the, uh, from the U.S. government. So we want to keep as much time as possible for discussion with you. I will emphasize that the conversation with you all after the speakers have finished their remarks is off the record. Uh, it will not be recorded, uh, so uh, we can have maximum candor uh, and openness about um, uh, the policy challenges we're facing in the Middle East and North Africa. So let me first, uh, again, uh, turn this over to uh, uh, Alfred Stepan. Uh, I will just say a few words about Professor Stepan. He's the Wallace Sayre Professor of Government the founding director of the Center for the Study of Democracy, Toleration, and Religion, and the co-director of the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life, all at Columbia University. His article on the relationship between religion and state in Tunisia's unfolding democratic transition, Tunisia's transition and the twin tolerations, appears in the current April 2012 issue of the Journal of Democracy. And all of you would have seen that there are copies of uh, the article. Um, uh, outside. Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll pick one up if you haven't already done so. Uh, so uh, Professor Stepan, again, has been among the most uh, creative and fruitful uh, thinkers on the relationship between religion uh, and democracy in many, many countries, and we're delighted to have him with us. Professor Stepan. Thank you very much, um, Tom and Tim, and the audience for coming here. Um, analysts of successful and failed democratic transitions make a, often make a distinction between civil society and polit political society. Civil society, by its occasional capacity to link together diverse groups into protest, can indeed deconstruct a government and even a regime. However, to construct a democracy, which most of us are concerned with here, that also needs the creation of what, are, what is called political society, uh, by which, by this I mean actors concerned with things such as election rules, elections, very much concerned with negotiation and compromise with other political actors, and eventually the possibility of creating a relatively consensual uh, rules of the game for a democratic constitution. That's so the task of civil society. Many people are in both, like Fernando Henrique Caroso, who just won a great award. He's a great friend from Brazil. He was a person who much of his life was civil society, but he moved to political society and eventually to being really a great president uh, of Brazil. Now, both Egypt and Tunisia had really extremely creative civil society movements. And here I would say that I, I had the good fortune 
in that both um, the Club of Madrid, which is ex-presidents and prime ministers, were looking for someone to go. They, they were asked by many of the young people on Terrar Square and on Bragiba Boulevard, can someone come here not to give us a big lecture, but to talk about five or six totally failed transitions, if, if that's the question, and four or five successful ones. When they asked me, and it was actually Freedom House that did, so I'm particularly upset by what happened to them, uh, because the people I talked to were really great young people in the streets who really made Terrar Square happen. Uh, and they were dying to talk about what happened. Now, uh, when I judge how creative civil society was in Egypt and in Tunisia, I would say that really, and I've looked at Brazil, I've looked at Chile, I've looked at Poland, I've looked at the Czech Republic, uh, they, it's ranks right up there, both of them, with the best. However, if I look at political society, I have to say that no country that has ever made a successful democratic transition has such a weak civil political society as Egypt does at the moment. And what's fascinating uh, is that Tunisia somehow constructed, and this is one of the things we'll explore, of very creative uh, civil society among people who basically went into this discussion almost hating one another. The people who almost hated one another were secularists who were convinced that if Islamists played a, a major role in the, in the society, they would reverse many of the most important gains that Bourguiba had made able to produce. It's the most progressive family code in the Arab world, that this would be destroyed. And the, and the Islamists felt that these were who they thought fundamentalist, fundamentalist secularists, who thought they were fundamentalist Islamists. So the, the two groups saw the other as dangerous fundamentalists, and they could never arrive at anything. Now, what's any agreement? Now, what's fascinating is that they did arrive at agreement in Tunisia and nothing, nothing yet in uh, Egypt. Now, the cost of not arriving at anything in Egypt is that even when I was talking to P S April 6th leaders, as early as March, right after the, the fall, early March, they were already spending a huge amount of effort as liberals, secularists, to try and figure out how they could get the military, one way or another, to write the Constitution before the Constituent Assembly. Now, in theoretical terms, this is really Brumarian abdication of their own responsibility. And they're looking, but this is because they so feared uh, that Muslims would win. And Muslims, again and again, also created a space for the military to stay because they wanted them uh, to control uh, some of these other parties. So, and neither form of that abdication happened in Tunisia. So I'll, uh, now, and I'll try and give some idea of why that happened. Uh, now, the, one of the reasons it happens, uh, and this is, I didn't find this out, I didn't find this out at all in my first visit. And I'm pretty good at this in that I started my career writing, I was a special foreign correspondent after my Marine Corps duty and after uh, uh, graduation from Oxford, a special foreign correspondent for The Economist. And I cut, went to hard places. So I'm telling you, in March 2011, I didn't get the point. I didn't get the point in June 2011. And I got it the last week of my trip in, uh, in November. And here's what I found out. I found out that four of the five largest parties in the Constituent Assembly in Tunisia have actually been meeting with each other every year since June 2003. That first meeting was in Aix-en-Provence, where they issued what is called the Call from Tunis. They signed their name. They put it on. They said what their position was in those organizations. At that time in 2003, I want to assure you that that was a punishable you, you, you easily could have gone to jail for it and probably died in jail for it. So this was not a costless affirmation. This was their own John Hancock. And uh, Nava uh, signed it. Uh, the three major secular parties in terms of seats signed it. And what did they negotiate over? They negotiated 
uh, over things that are very close to what I'll call the twin tolerations. So maybe I'll just say a word about twin tolerations before we get it, although I, I wrote quite a few years ago. But I, I wrote about the twin tolerations when I finished a decade-long project with Juan Linz called Problems of Democratic Transition and Consolidation, Southern Europe, South America, and Post-Communist Europe. And then I was also was a founding rector of Central European University. And with that one book behind me, I said, what's the big new agenda that we're going to have to think about as democratic activists, as people who want to talk with people who are real activists, but in, in a conversation? And I said, for whatever reason, none of us in that first generation of democratization theorists was paying attention to religion. But I had a feeling that that was going to be seen by many people as a number one blocking point, And we had to think about it. So that's when I began to write the Twin Tolerations. And I'm happy to say that Thursday I start a two-year sabbatical in which I'll actually turn it into a big book and discuss many of the, the religions. It'll be every one of the world's religions, many of which I left out. I left out Buddhism, I left out Judaism, I left out uh, Hinduism, but each one will be seen from the viewpoint of the twin tolerations. But basically the, the first toleration is that, of, is that religious citizens and organizations, if their attitude, toleration towards the state, it requires that they accord democratically elected officials the freedom to legislate and govern without having to confront denials of their authority based on religious claims such as the claim that only God, not man, can make laws. The second toleration is that of the state towards religious citizens. This type of toleration requires that laws and officials must permit religious citizens as a matter of right, and many people don't agree with this, uh, to some extent, John uh, Rawls does it. Uh, as a matter of right, to freely take part in politics, as long as religious activists and organizations respect other citizens' constitutional rights and the law. In a democracy, unlike John Rawls, religion should not be taken off the agenda. Matter of fact, this demand that religion be taken off the agenda, if some non-democratic religious activists have put it on the agenda, how silly a thing will it be to follow the, uh, the idea that you should not introduce, allow religion to get into the public discourse because it's already in the public discourse. So some people who are Democrats and Democratic Islamists have to engage as public intellectuals, as civil society members, and actually as political society. All dimensions. Oh, please do not close. I, I thought I thought it would. The same thing. Okay, thank you. Th thank you. I wish you told me earlier. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, right. Now, how did this, the, here, let me just go, uh, so there's a twin tolerations on both sides. Democratic government needs a certain toleration from religious actors, and religious actors, I believe, need and deserve toleration from democratic actors if their citizens can ex uh, exercise their normal rights. So either way, you're going to violate democracy unless you give each other tolerations. I talk much more about this, but it's amazing how many major theorists of secularism uh, almost deny the right of many religious people to participate in this public discourse, and I think this is theoretically uh, quite wrong. Now, um, let me just mention one or two of the things that happened in the first uh, Tunis, and it happened again and again. Uh, I have the documents. And um, one was that uh, the, the call from Tunis endorsed the two fundamental principles of the twin tolerations. Uh, one, any future elected government would have to be founded, quote, founded on the sovereignty of the people as the sole source of legitimacy. And when I talk with Canucci, who had met uh, when I was teaching in Oxford and we, when he was in exile in, in London, uh, he said, no, we, we, we have to really make a distinction between democracy is about sovereignty of the citizens. And that, it's simple. They cannot, you cannot take away their sovereignty, and so that means the sovereignty of their votes. Uh, and 
that we can be informed, we can argue for Islam being a part of it, but if we're having a democracy, it's sovereignty of the people. Now this was insisted by the three secular party that and not assign this in the call from Tunis, and they actually did sign it. And now they wanted uh, the secularist to uh, say that, that, that in, for normal politics and normal public life, there can be a space uh, for, for uh, Islam in public life. And, cause, and so that, that and they, they, they both gave each other, and they signed, a guarantee of liberty of beliefs to all in the political neutralization of places of worship. And Nada accepted both of these and also went further, except went on, the call also went on to demand, and, and Nada signed it, the full equality of men and women. Now, the four major leaders went on many other times to deepen this, and there are many other documents uh, about this. Uh, for instance, one time in 2005 was a three-month dialogue uh, between, among the party leaders, and they reached a consensus on a number of issues. Uh, the family code would, uh, and, and Ganucci is pretty good on this. Ganucci says, look, democracy is a way of governing the territory. Territories are different. So he's not really a pan-Islamist. And you have to figure out if there's certain specificities in your own country. And you better pay attention to this. A, speci a specificity here, I, I might not have done it, but there's a, f a really liberal family code for women, and we have to accept that as a specificity, a correct specificity that's actually consistent with Islam and consistent with this country. And this country's not gonna go forward if we try and reverse that. Then they also, they, they really fought heavily to define a civil state. This is something in all my discussions with two or three of the top Muslim Brotherhood people in Egypt, they still have difficulty with the question of civil state. As, as late as June uh, 2011, they still have some words from the 2007 document that, that and now they just simply said, no, this is unacceptable. Um, and the... And that is they put in on the later documents that a civic state draws its legitimacy from the will of the people for political practice as a human discipline without any form of sanctity. Finally, the manifesto asserted that, quote, there can be no compulsion in religion, classic Islamic uh, statement, and this includes the right to adopt a religion or doctrine or not. So there's an element of exit uh, agreed to here, which is highly unusual. Okay, now, something like what I've just talked about has happened in Indonesia in the 15 years before the democratic transition. It happened in Senegal in the 10 years before the democratic transition. And in a very different way, it happened in the eight years, uh, the last eight years of Pinochet before it was leading up to the constitutional debate. The, the Christian Democrats who really hated the socialists and the socialists who hated the Christian Democrats started an eight-year negotiation strikingly similar to the call from Tunis. And people are creating this sense of the twin tolerations. Um, now, th this is interesting because when Ben Ali fled uh, on January 14th, almost immediately, um, uh, the, prime, the premier, also called Gonucci, uh, assigned two people to draft very quick legislation for a rapid presidential election. And of which, so it would have meant the system was presidential, probably the premier would have won it. And what was fascinating was the next day, civil society people went and started a strike right outside the prime minister's residence in, in, in the area that's called Kasbah. So that's Kasbah one. But then civil society were smart enough to issue because some of them were involved in some of these other discussions. They say, look, there are political parties that exist. They have to be present at that discussion. And all the political parties said, yes, we want to be at that discussion. So they agreed to begin to negotiate the terms of the game for a democratic transition. Uh, and they, want, they contested and won this. There's never been any comparable con uh, contestation and victory of this sort yet in Egypt. So my, my great colleague for many years, Juan Linz, is always asking me when I was in Egypt, send me the documents. I said, what documents do you want? And he says, I want the documents where the secular and religious leaders have agreed 
with, with some negotiation on a round table, something like the Polish round table, something like uh, that Havel had, something like that we've looked at in many, many places, the Pacte Moncloa. I said, Juan, there's nothing like it. I found it in Tunisia, but it's not here. And now this, but having this prior discussion meant that within days of Ben Ali leaving, they created what something called a commission, the Ben Ashur Commission, that fundamentally, in terms of democratic theory, is to uh, decide on key, key things that you need to make a democracy. Now, I think it's quite brilliant uh, that they focused on almost, some people criticize this, a procedural. They, they had a two-day debate where they want to talk about agrarian reform and so on. People said, look, all those are policies. Those policies will be better, more legitimate, more accepted, if they're the policies of a democratically elected government. So let's get on with the fact, what do we need to do to have a democratically elected government? And uh, so they arrived at a decision that the only thing they really had to decide was something that's indispensable for having a democratic election. I, I rather admire this, because it focused they, were, they could have disagreed on a huge amount of things. But they said, look, so they agreed that uh, the first thing to do is don't allow anyone to create something like presidentialism or anything. Is ha the first thing we should do is to have an election for a constituent assembly, which will deliberate. These will be legitimated representatives to talk about what type of structure we need. So we'll have a, con and that constituent assembly will decide whether it's parliamentarianism, presidentialism, semi-presidentialism, but we'll discuss it. Then the next thing, in terms of just indispensable decision, you have to decide what type of an election. I mean, is it gonna be PR? If it's gonna be simple majority? And here was interesting. This is a hugely consequential decision. They decided to have PR. And the first party to really support it was actually Gannucci's party. They un uh, if they had chosen a British first-past-the-post single-member district, Anada would have won 92% of the seats to the Constituent Assembly. If they, but they chose, rather consciously, PR, because Anada felt they would get somewhere between 35 to 50% of the votes. Uh, but they didn't want 91% of the seats. Uh, when I talked with Ganucci years ago, he said, I've been in Iran. Iran doesn't work. I've been in, I've been in Algeria. That's a horrendous civil war. You don't want to win that big. So one of the reasons is he, he wanted to avoid a horrendous civil war. He wanted people to accept the election. So he supported proportional representation, and that reduced his majority from 92% to 40%. Okay, now to help ensure the participation of women in the, uh, because everyone, the biggest worry was whether uh, the, the right, the best women's code in the Arab uh, League, uh, this would be reversed. There was a debate to put every other name on the electoral list be a woman. They only made one mistake. They should have said every list had to alternate. I mean, but so it was, every other name was a woman, so they have 27%. It's not 50% because a lot of the people, it's the rule of odd numbers. If you don't put a woman first, every one is gonna be a man, the two would be a woman, every three is gonna be uh, a man, a four, a, so it, it just multiplies. Uh, everyone says that, uh, that Inada was probably the first party to totally embrace this every other, partly because they were looking for credible guarantees. Credible guarantees of political science uh, phrase meaning, uh, a credible guarantee would be, I help create something that once it's created will block me, inhibit me from doing something that you most are terrified I'm gonna do. So from Ganucci's viewpoint, a credible guarantee might be having 50% of the people in the constituent assembly being women. And that's why he wanted to support it, because he didn't have many credible guarantees that he felt he could give. People were still frightened. Um, other things that they assumed, they, uh, Egypt had a ridiculous approach towards um, 
of foreign observers, they first said it's a violation of sovereignty. Well, 75 countries in the world have had, uh, including France and the United States, has had observers. Uh, and th they're pretty sovereign countries. Uh, and um, uh, Tunisia, everyone in this uh, consulting committee decided that it's in the, everybody's interest to have the elections be as free and fair as possible and be seen as free and fair and therefore to use it again uh, in the future. So let's have international observers, let's have national observers, let's build in as much credibility. Every single president of the parties I talked to said the elections were free and fair, and every single one of them are gonna compete in the next election, and they think they're all, what's very nice is almost all of them think they're gonna win the next election. And so there'll be an election after the Constituent Assembly, so people know that there's an election coming up after the Constituent Assembly. <coughs> and think that they will do fairly well in it. Um, okay, so that's, uh, th this is useful because some of the things that are useful, five, 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 okay, the, obviously we're not talking about consolidation of democracy, that's a different theoretical thing, it takes much longer, many more things have to be done, but for what Juan Linz and I said in page one, of our book, Problems of Democratic Transition, we gave four requirements for democratic transition to be completed. When I reread those pages, the day after, on, on December 24th, when the Constituent Assembly met, after free and fair elections, after the government was formed, and after there was no military or religious constraint on policy, I said, wow, they've met all four of our requirements. And then I checked it out on Egypt, my judgment then, and now is that Egypt has not yet completed one of the four requirements. So this coming together, this discussion uh, for the, creating the atmosphere of the twin tolerations was really crucial. And so I think the f some of the things that are useful here is that you have two coalition, two parties in the three-party coalition are secular. And it's de facto a parliamentary body meaning that you need 50.1% to rule. If Ganucci, if Ennada yields too much to their own followers uh, 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 and starts pushing for harder things, I expect and I hope that one of the two secularist parties will walk out and the government will fall and it can be reconstituted. I mean, that's a, par that's a parliamentary system. So the parliamentary system itself can give some constraints. Um, then the Constituent Assembly also just works as the Spanish transition did and, and uh, the, the Indian did one as basically a parliamentary body and therefore you need this majority. Um, I, I also think that the fact that Juan Linz and I talk about when democracy becomes the only game in town. Democracy becomes the only game in town when people are not necessarily total Democrats but who feel that trying to win power any other way besides election is probably not gonna work, and it may be very dangerous, and it may get you in jail. So all of a sudden, the more people believe that elections are the only game in town, the better that is uh, for democracy. Elections are beginning to be the only game in town in Tunisia. There are million games in town in Egypt. Um, the, okay, three cautionary notes about possible consolidation of a democracy. In a forthcoming volume I edited with Miriam Kunkler, who's on a tenure track position at Princeton, and it was a Columbia dissertation, the, the a volume is called Islam and Democracy in Indonesia Comparative Perspectives. Uh, Miriam Kunkler argues, pretty incredibly, and but very convincingly, that in the 10 years leading up to the, en the end of, um, the military in Tunisia, democracy had become the consensual preferred doctrine of Indonesia's 40 million members of NU, led by Gastur, and the 30 million member, Mohammedia. So uh, when I think of Tunisia, I'm just painfully aware that because they were totally illegal, and the cost of illegality, the cost of any of us allowing illegality or supporting it creates huge problems because among other things, this type of dialogue that was emerged in Indonesia, that two of these huge 70 million member organizations are consensually democratic before the transition, 
and now is not consensually democratic. Its top leadership is consensually democratic. Mm -hmm. But the rank and file have not ever been exposed to, to what uh, he talks about as a political theology. The political theology means you need, you need to have lots of discussions. You need schools where you talk about Islam. That's democratic. Where you have theology centers. There's no theology center here. Uh, and so this is a huge problem. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible, but some of the things that may have to be done to, to improve it are things that some people, maybe some people in this room, will feel is very dangerous. You're going to need Muslim radio stations of, that are Tunisian Muslim radio stations. And you're going to need television stations that talks about it because that's been totally illegal since Bourguiba's time. So there is no, there are, and, and, and there, there, Zaituna Mosque, uh, university, Mosque University, which was founded 220 years before al Hasar, and in many areas was as good or better, was totally abolished uh, and reduced to a tiny, uh, tiny department inside a secular university, but basically destroyed uh, by Bourguiba in the name of aggressive 1905 French secularism. So you almost have no theological foundation for, uh, for and, and what, what he will call political theology that, that had any room to develop. So people, young kids, many people, still want to hear something about their religion. So they hear. They turn on because the, they can't quite check them all. It's all coming from Gulf states, from total dictatorships, uh, Wahhabi sin. That's what's coming in all the time. So I, I would think you've got to create, and, and we shouldn't be alarmed when there's some uh, Tunisian Muslim radio stations and television stations that are piping out a different version of Islam, and, and we need better schools. Okay. And finally, let me, uh, there's virtually none of that right now. So everything's coming from the Gulf states. Uh, finally, the economy. I think it's clear that the best chance of any Arab country to be a democracy in the foreseeable future is Tunisia. Now that, in comparative terms, vastly raises the importance and the stakes. Because it, what it means is that if the best chance fails, if the best chance fails, many people will say, well, huh, I told you so. There's Arab, Arabs and democracy, it's just not really something. And let's continue to bet on other types of uh, other types of co more author authoritative, if not authoritarian, uh, coalitions. And so the cost of them failing is huge for a world. Now, because if, no, then, then we have to ask ourselves, I wanna, are we really up for the historical moment? Uh, when we think of the three in the last century, there have been three huge historical moments. Uh, and that's that the Nazis, and the Italians, the fascist Italians, the Nazis in Germany, the fascist Italians, and to some extent in Japan, were defeated by the Allies. They were externally defeated by the Allies. Nonetheless, the Allies decided to rebuild the German economy and the Italian economy, and they, and, and, and democracies emerged out of it. That was an amazing gesture, and, and it was a, basically a very creative and proactive stance towards history in the making. Uh, when the wall came down, that was amazing. The Europeans stood up. Eight former members of the Warsaw Pact within 10 years or 12 years were in the European Union. That's amazing. And so if we're looking at the, why, why, the, why the Nazis fell, they fell because of external reasons. Why did the wall come down? Mainly because they were all members of the Warsaw Pact with, with, led by Russia. And Gorbachev, 15 months before the wall came down, had a very famous meeting that Archie Brown has now documented, where he told all the first secretaries that when, you got, when they got wobbly in, in, in Hungary, we sent in Soviet tanks. When they got wobbly in 56, when they got wobbly, in, in Czechoslovakia, in 68, we sent in Soviet tanks. I am not going to send in Soviet tanks. 
So figure out how to hold yourself together. Now, what it meant was the relations of coercion changed almost instantly, and that's why some of these places just collapsed, okay? Now, what's impressive about the Arab Spring is that there was no really external event that contributed to this diffusion, and it's internal. And the other thing that's impressive is there's been no comparable, creative, proactive uh, response to it. I don't know the exact facts, and probably some people in the room do, but basically we all know that uh, Egypt's going to continue to get $1.3 billion to the army, even after uh, Freedom House event. We still reiterate it will give $1.3 billion. Uh, I don't know the exact details, but uh, Jordan, who also has a special relationship, uh, is probably going to get $500 million. I don't know why, but some people say Morocco's going to get $500 million. And what we have in, in Tunisia was, I'm, I'm happy that she went there and made the announcement, but it's pretty slim pickings. It's $100 million. Maybe it's more than this. But when I talked to many of the people in the embassy there, they said, this, is, this will be ordinary international ordinary international economic. They'll get some money. It'll take some time. It won't be necessarily exactly for what they want, but they'll be a part. But this is not a normal moment. Uh, you really have to have some success. I can't tell you how the French left is still continuing to write terrible articles, including one even depict, uh, uh, printed in the, in the New York Review of Books, which is below what Robert Silver should have done. Uh, but it was a total attack and said the, the votes in Tunisia show that the Tunisians have not embraced liberty. Uh, or they wouldn't have voted the way they did. Now, a lot of French people just don't go there. Uh, so the French tourists aren't there yet. The, the hotels are virtually 10% capacity, and some of the big ones. So it's, uh, I, I don't think that with that, the, the unemployed from 18 to 35, people say is pushing over 40%. So this is, this is a moment for real, proactive, historic response. And so far, we're not up to that historical moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Al Stepan, uh, for a very powerful argument for the importance of not only keeping religion on the table in these democratic transitions, but making religion central to uh, democratic negotiation. Uh, my pleasure now is to introduce uh, Dan Philpot, who is associate professor in the Department of Political Science and the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he's authored uh, uh, several uh, uh, important uh, works. Most recently, just come out this past week, uh, Just an Unjust Peace, an Ethic of Political Reconciliation, published by uh, Oxford, which proposes a form of political reconciliation that is deeply rooted in three religious traditions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Dan, pleasure to have you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here as well. No question is more hotly disputed in the events of the Arab Spring and continues to be hotly disputed than whether Islam is a friend or a foe of prospects for democracy there. As soon as the Arab Spring got underway, the culture wars descended on the events. Hawks held that once Islam was released from state supervision, theocracy was just around the corner. Doves rejoined that Islam could support democracy were it only allowed to participate in politics. Although the Obama administration may not easily fit either category, there is evidence that worry about Islam explains its slowness to support the democratic revolution in Egypt in February of last year. Well, few people can help us get at this problem better than Al Stepan. And it's rare that someone can bring to problems like this both the scholarly acuity of one of our generation's leading comparative political scientists and the talents of a star reporter, in this case, our man on the scene in Tunisia, <laughs> a talent surely dating back to his days as, re as a reporter for The Economist. Al's piece on the twin tolerations of 2001 continues to stand as one of the seminal pieces for the study of religion and politics and an inspiration for the surge of this study in the past decade. When Monica Shoft, uh, that's a combination of our names there. When Monica Toft, <laughs> Tim Shaw, and I wrote our own book on religion and politics, God Century, Al's piece took on an almost religious significance for us, something like Holy Writ. 
Al argues strenuously that religion, that is religious people and groups in every major religion, can be and often are supportive of democracy. But he argues the relationship between religion and state within a, within a democracy is a two-way street. The state must also support the freedom of religion, both to practice its faith and to participate in democratic politics. This side of the twin tolerations, the state's toleration of religion, is a message that he believes needs to be heard by secularists in the West, as well as secular dictators in other parts of the world. Well, Al convincingly argues that Tunisia is a critical case, both for the possibility of Islamic democracy in general and for prospects for democracy in the Arab Spring. Tunisia, in fact, exhibits both sides of the twin tolerations, a state willing to allow the participation of Islam and an Islamic party willing to play the democratic game. I'd like to say a little about each of these sides of the twin tolerations. Secular states can be repressive in a way that is distinct to their secularism. Monica, Tim, and I call them seculocracies in an article that we wrote in the Christian Science Monitor, a term that was originally Tim's, to give credit where credit's due. Though the point is often lost in today's polemics, authoritarianism in Muslim-majority countries is indeed strongly associated with regimes inspired by secular ideals, just as it is with regimes built on Islam. In my own research on regimes in Muslim-majority countries, I found that among 35 of these regimes that are authoritarian, 14 or 40 percent are what I call restrictive secular, in contrast with 21 or 60 percent that are Islamist or built around strongly traditional and repressive versions of Sharia law. That's probably the conventional wisdom that they're Islamist, but 40 percent restrictive secular is indeed significant. By restrictive secular, I mean regimes that use state power to manage religion and do so on behalf of an agenda informed by modernity involving social equality, nationalism, and economic development. While their rulers may well call themselves Muslim and might practice Islam, and while their constitutions may even proclaim that they are an Islamic state, these regimes seek not to promote Islam, but rather to control, contain, and if possible to privatize it. It is in this sense that they can be called secular. An indicator of such a regime is that they often have a ministry of religious affairs. In a common pattern, such regimes support and often officially establish, but also co-opt and sharply regulate a moderate form of Islam that is compatible with its ruling purposes while suppressing and marginalizing more conservative and traditional forms of Islam. Typically, restrictive secular regimes will justify their management of Islam with the argument that radical Islam is the alternative to them. It's me or the Muslim Brotherhood, as Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak told a succession of U.S. presidents. The prototype of restrictive secular regimes, of course, is the Republic of Turkey, founded in 1924 by Kemal Ataturk, who, while a Muslim himself, in typical according to the pattern, sought sharply to regulate and contain Islam in order that Turkey might modernize. He was inspired by the West, especially the French Revolution and its legacy of laicite. The Turkish model prevailed in the Arab world after World War II, as well as in Iran under the Shah, Iraq under Saddam, and Indonesia under Suharto. And it was exactly what prevailed under Bourguiba and then Ben Ali in Tunisia, as Al documents so well in what he calls the Lost Decades. The Tunisia of 1956 to 2011 attests that behind authoritarianism in Islam in the Islamic world is the French Revolution and not just the Iranian Revolution. Al also persuades me that Tunisia illustrates the other side of the twin tolerations, an Islamic party that is willing to play the democratic game. Ennahda's commitment, both in exile and in current politics, to respect the equality of women, support a broad religious freedom, abjure an official religious council that would review re legislation, and abide by the results of free elections, all bode well for democracy in Tunisia. This is hopeful because, as Al has shown in his work with Graham Robertson, democracy has been rare in Muslim-majority countries in the Arab world. It is more common outside the Arab world, as, he, as they document, offering evidence for the compatibility of Islam and democracy. Islamic parties compete for votes, win elections, and stand for elections again, 
and willing, be willing to, are willing to lose elections and stand down in Bangladesh, Malaysia, Pakistan, Turkey, and perhaps most significantly, the largest Muslim state in the world, Indonesia. Today, about one-fourth of the 47 or so Muslim-majority states have regular contested democratic elections, not an overwhelming portion, but enough to confirm the possibility. There is also the evidence of uh, sociologist Charles Kurtzman and Ijlal Nakfi that in the last four decades, Islamic parties have become more involved in elections, are more involved the higher the levels of democracy, and that Islamist parties have performed worse than moderate Islamic parties. However, there is a point on which I would like to press Al to think further, and is one that reflects the cause of the project that is sponsoring this consultation religious freedom. I want to begin by pointing out that it cannot at all be taken for granted that regimes that are democratic in the electoral sense will also respect religious freedom. Al and his co-author Juan Linz have argued that democracy should be construed so as to include civil rights and minority rights, a definition which I find attractive. But let's remember that religious freedom can be missing from otherwise democratic regimes. We think of Farid Zakaria's concept of illiberal democracy. By religious freedom, I mean the immunity of individuals and religious communities from coercion in the discovery, determination, practice, organization, governance, financing, and communication of their religious beliefs. In general, strong religious freedom, like democracy, is found among a significant number of Muslim countries, though still a minority of about one-fourth, according to Pew Forum data. My more nuanced point, though, is that even electoral democracies may not have high levels of religious freedom. My own research shows that among the 47 Muslim-majority countries, the more democratic a country is, the more likely it is to guarantee religious freedom in the aggregate. However, there are some quite significant cases of Muslim democracies that still repress dissenters and minorities. Take Turkey, for instance, which has made wonderful strides towards a religiously inclusive democracy under the Justice and Development Party since 2002. And I think that the rule of the AK Party is a definite stride towards the twin tolerations, towards a religiously informed democracy. Uh, so there's, there's definitely movement in the right direction. And yet at the same time, little has changed by way of the Kamalist Republic's strong control over the conduct of religion, or the harsh treatment of minorities, including Sufi and Alevi Muslims and Christians. In Indonesia, again, a great example of a democracy brought about by Islamic movements and a great example of a, a stride towards the twin tolerations, the government still strongly restricts proselytism, has outlawed the Ahmadiyya sect, and has done little to stop attacks on Muslim minority sects and Christians. Much the same could be said for Malaysia and Pakistan democracy, but serious restrictions on religious freedom. As Al's research suggests, this is a plausible outcome for Egypt, an electoral democracy where Islamic parties are willing to contest and to stand down when defeated, but also where Coptic Christians may continue to suffer harsh discrimination. While Al's research on the Inada party shows its declarative support for religious freedom, and this is a question just because I don't know uh, the, the details, it would be interesting to know how much the new regime has departed from re religious restrictions of the previous regime, including regulation of the public wearing of headscarves and traditional Muslim dress for males. What do you see out there when you stroll down Bergiba uh, Boulevard? Government control and subsidizing of mosques and appointment of the, Grand National, the National Grand Mufti or restrictions on the public display of minority faiths, as in the cancellation of a Roman Catholic procession in 2010. If the twin tolerations is a two-way street, has Tunisia taking the, taken the exit ramp off of Bergiba Boulevard? <laughs> the issue of religious freedom is a crucial one for deciding whether Tunisia or any of the other Arab Spring countries has achieved the twin tolerations. Tunisia, Turkey, Indonesia, and other countries show that Islamic parties can play the democratic game. But unless they guarantee full religious freedom, a crucial dimension of the twin tolerations will be missing. On the level of justice, the protection of the religious freedom rights of minorities and dissenters is crucial to human dignity. But beyond intrinsic justice, the success and stability of new democracies in the Arab world 
key, a key dem American foreign policy interest to come to the for, for a consultation, the policy consultation, also depends on religious freedom. Another argument that Toft, Shah, and I make in God's century is that religious groups are likely to become more radicalized and violent when they live under regimes that deny them autonomy and political participation, whether these regimes be seculocracies or theocracies. The Shah of Iran, uh, America's uh, longtime friend, showed how repressive secularism breeds Islamic radicalism. Islamic radicalism, or at least rebellious discontent, uh, was also bred by Egypt from Nasser to Mubarak. One thinks of al-Qaeda's uh, al-Zawahiri, who was kind of radicalized in the jails and torture cells of Mubarak, a point made by uh, Mustafa Akil in today's New York Times. Um, other examples are Algeria under the uh, FLN, Saudi Arabia, Saddam's Iraq, Assad, Syria, and Suharto's Indonesia. The, the obverse dynamic is that religious groups are most likely to be peaceful and supportive of democracy when they live under regimes that respect their autonomy. Understanding that religion can be supportive of democracy and that democracy lasts longest when it allows religious freedom is crucial for American foreign policy if it wants to secure its interest in stable democracy overseas, not least in the Arab Spring. Thanks very much, uh, Dan. Uh, Moving down the uh, the panel as uh, as rapidly as we can. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dan, for uh, making further set of arguments for the importance of uh, of a broad understanding of religious freedom in this discussion. I now am pleased to inter introduce uh, William Inboden, who is also a fellow of our Religious Freedom uh, Project, uh, like uh, Dan. Uh, William Inboden is assistant professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and distinguished scholar at the Strauss Center for International Security and Law at the University of Texas, Austin. He has a lot of foreign policy experience. He was, among other things, senior director for strategic planning at the, at, at the National Security Council, uh, had been a member of the policy planning staff of the State Department, has been in the International Religious Freedom Office. Uh, he is, among a number of scholarly works, author of Religion and American Foreign Policy, 1945 to 1960, The Soul of Containment, published by Cambridge in 2008. He's also a contributing editor at Foreign Policy. William Bowden. Okay. Thank you, Tim. And uh, let me add my echoes of uh, approbation and praise and, and gratitude to, to Al for what's, I think, a fantastic uh, article and uh, some uh, you know, follow on uh, provocative remarks there as well. Uh, th there's a you know perennial debate. I, I would say it's in policy and academic circles, but frankly, uh, it's more in academic circles about how can academic research be made policy relevant and uh, how can it matter to anything beyond the, the faculty lounge. I think this is a great case of policy relevant research um, that, uh, as I'll try to share, may have some very specific implications for American foreign policy. Uh, for any of you uh, policymakers uh, here, particularly in um, uh, Congress and and the executive branch. Uh, I also think this is a marvelous model of sort of testing and refining a theory uh, in the midst of ongoing real world developing events. Um, you know, I think you've probably picked up that uh, Al's twin tolerations model is uh, really the, the gold standard for religious freedom theorists and also a lot of democracy theorists. Uh, but when we have ongoing unfolded events like the Arab Spring, you always wonder how will the, the past models uh, hold up? And I think this is a great way of uh, testing it in the real world laboratory of, of, of Tunisia. Uh, so just a, a few uh, thoughts on, on Al's comments and also on uh, some of the text in the article, including a couple sections I found very interesting in the article that he didn't talk about so much in, in his or oral remarks. Um, first, to, to put this in a little bit of uh, context as far as the place of Tunisia in, in American foreign policy, um, uh, I think the real question we're all wrestling with is how much of a model can can Tunisia be? Um, and this, you know, in turn relates to how important has Tunisia been in American foreign policy? Uh, I think historically it's safe to say that Tunisia was not a signal priority for American foreign policy, at least compared to a number of other countries in the region, such as Egypt or Saudi Arabia or, 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 or Turkey. Uh, Tunisia's main 
role was kind of that uh, sort of not so troublesome place where you send FSOs to do Arabic language training. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but as we saw with uh, you know the Mohammed Bouazizi's self-immolation and the launch of the Arab Spring, Tunisia can at moments be supremely important and a real catalyst for profound, literally globe-changing uh, uh, dy dynamics and events. So uh, while I think all of us here are hopeful and invested in Tunisia's own uh, success as a uh, pluralistic religious freedom respecting uh, Muslim democracy. Uh, there's Im implicit in that, and even explicit in some parts of the article, is the hope that Tunisia can also really be uh, continue to play a outsized, influential, positive role in in the region. Um, now. Uh, reading through the article, uh, one irony is struck by, especially given our own concerns here with what are the implications is for American foreign policy, is uh, you know the almost complete absence of American foreign policy in Al's diagnosis in the article of Tunisia's transition. The only time I really saw the U.S. brought up as an explicit actor was when one of the American democracy NGOs gave the secular party the bad advice to do television advertising <laughs> um, rather than grassroots mobilizing. Uh, so unnamed NGO. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so it's not to uh, impl implicate the guilty here. Um, and on the one hand, maybe this is a real good news story as far as Tunisian ownership of this, because we all know that ultimately, you know, not to lapse into too many cliches, the U.S. can't impose democracy. It's got to be owned uh, and, and bought into by, by the locals themselves. So maybe this is a great, great news story there. Could also be that, and Tamara, I'll want to hear some of your reflections on this, that maybe the U.S. role was more substantial, but it's best for all uh, all parties that it wasn't wasn't so visible. Uh, or uh, a third possibility is that the U.S. role was not significant at all in Tunisia, but Tunisia is a fairly significant, uh, fairly unique case, and one reason that the Egyptian transition hasn't gone uh, more uh, salubriously thus far is because uh, there's more of a need for a more active U.S. role. Uh, that's something we can take up during during the uh, the Q and A time. Um, there's also a fascinating section in uh, the article, which, you, Al, you didn't talk about as much in your oral remarks, on, on a usable past. Yeah. And you, you, you alluded to this with the, with the Zaytuna Mosque. But uh, a really interesting uh, middle section in the article, I encourage all of you to read if you haven't, on how Tunisia's own history contains some real resources for Muslim democracy, for religious pluralism and tolerance, and even religious freedom, both its ancient past going back to the founding of uh, the Zaytuna University Mosque, uh, but also also more, more recently. Now, I'm a historian by training myself, so I'm very sympathetic to the notion of, of a usable past and also just how history functions in these different societies. But again, I uh, was wondering how how transferable is this? I think we could also make the case that Egypt has a very positively use, uh, usable past for a pluralistic democratic tran transition as well. I mean, it certainly uh, is you know the the cradle of uh, of of, uh, of global civilization going back to the time of the pharaohs, where Egypt was the most leading uh, technological. Uh, and uh, and re research society in the world, um, it's got a very resilient uh, community of non-Muslims, the the Coptic Christians, as, uh, especially who depending on you know the numbers you believe are probably around 10 percent of the uh, of the population. So again, a, uh, a sort of a historic experience with with, with pluralism. Uh, you've got a you know uh, again a leading non-extremist school of theology in in Al Azhar. Um, uh, and then Egypt has, uh, you know, certainly we all know the story of the uh, Egyptian radicals such as Said Qutb and Hassan al-Banna, but there's also a uh, number of very progressive, uh, pluralistic-minded Egyptian thinkers, more recently Saad Ibrahim and, and Ayman Nur. Um, and yet, even with this usable past, Egypt has not been able to choose the better path of a, a pluralistic democratic transition. Uh, so I just uh, wonder how how can uh, a past be more usable when the resources are there and yet it, it's not being grasped. Uh, turning to the specific question of the twin tolerations in, in Tunisia, um, again, I think this is a very encouraging story that is uh, told thus far. On the question of uh, its resilience within Tunisia and how transferable it might be, I, I want to hope for the best, but I the, the pessimist in me or, or the skeptic uh, notes that it seems to be that the Islamists have made many more concessions, really, than the, the secularist uh, when it comes to this this grand bargain that, that's, that's been struck. Uh, specifically, um, 
you know, very significant things that one would think conflict with other understandings of Sharia law, such as allowing women and non-Muslims to hold uh, national leadership positions, allowing conversion away from Islam, at, at least on, on paper, uh, not seeking any type of imposition of, of Islamic law. These concessions made uh, by uh, by the, uh, the the Islamists are, are very, very significant. If they hold, I think that speaks very well for Tunisia's transition. I don't know uh, to what extent those will hold or uh, how, how transferable they might be. Likewise, uh, what will be the place of the very small minority of non-Muslims in, in Tunisia, Christians, Jews, and Baha'is especially? Oftentimes a great proxy for the overall uh, health of a pluralistic society is how does it treat its religious minorities. Um, so, uh, and likewise, will the Anada party be able to resist pressures from its own right flank, if, if you will, from the more purely Islam Islamist and Salafist voices in, in Tunisia who are going to be pushing for a more uncompromising uh, sh Sharia? Turning to the question of specific policy implications, uh, especially for, for the U.S., um, a few that jumped out to me, if this model is to be transferable, um, and I think it, it, uh, it, it might in part, one is the <coughs> importance of early engagement, uh, uh, specifically this 2003 meeting, the production of the, of the call, call from Tunis. I mean, that appears really prescient in hindsight. Now, uh, in the narrative that you tell, Al, that was mostly an indigenous Tunisian movement with a little bit of support from the French who allowed them to, to, to meet there. Um, um, but perhaps in other cases, the U.S. should be encouraging and sponsoring and convening similar workshops in other Muslim-majority countries, especially ones that haven't even started a democratic transition yet. You know, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, uh, the UAE, some, some of the other Gulf states. Now, I know that some of these workshops have already always already been done. Uh, Tamara can maybe t share with us some, some good news stories mm -hmm. from, from the MEPI mm -hmm. program. So when I say that this might be a policy implication for the U.S., it doesn't necessarily mean that we're not doing it yet. Uh, but if we are good, let's do let's do more of it. Um, likewise, related to early engagement is early in intervention. Uh, and this is when a transition does seem to be uh, underway. Uh, in the midst of the transition, uh, perhaps right after the old regime goes, uh, perhaps more active U.S. involvement to uh, help help support the creation of an inclusive and representative transition council. Again, I, th I think it's uh, absolutely correct that that was uh, key for the progress we've seen thus far in, uh, in, in Tunisia. Um, these things are best done, of course, uh, you know, they must be done with, with local ownership. So uh, sometimes the U.S. can maybe help be a, a catalyst and an encourager there, but, uh, uh, but ultimately the locals will have to have, uh, have, have buy-in. Again, when I say this is a good idea for U.S. policy, it doesn't mean it you know, hasn't been done, um, but, uh, but certainly could, could be done more. Mm -hmm. Then some, I think there's some very specific implications for religious freedom policy. I mean, let's, you know, we're talking about democratic transitions here, but really religious freedom is the elephant in, in the room, especially in the case of Tunisia, where the twin toleration seem to have been central, not peripheral to Tunisia's uh, tra transition thus far. Um, and again, here's where I'll be a little more critical of, uh, of U.S. foreign policy. And this applies to the Bush administration, where I served for five years, as well as the Obama administration. Although, you know, Tamara, I'm uh, ready to be rebuked. <laughs> so, you know, slap my hand if I get out of line here. Um, but... Uh, Religious freedom is still largely absent uh, in the big picture from American government policy towards the Arab Spring. Um, you know, MEPI doesn't seem to mention it as a funding priority. Maybe there have been some religious freedom programs funded by MEPI. I'd, uh, you know, I would, I would certainly be encouraged to, to hear that. Um, we've got some representatives from the uh, noble but often beleaguered religious freedom office at the State Department here. Um, I love you folks. Uh, I would love to see you able to play a more central role in uh, American policy toward, towards, towards the Arab Spring. Um, but ultimately, this has to come from the top. Uh, this, you know, we need presidential and secretary of state uh, commitment to this, sustained engagement, speaking out on this, uh, making uh, more statements on what a priority this is, both because of the signal that sends to the region, but also because of the signal it sends to the American bureaucracy here about what mid-level officials need to be at the table when the, the nuts and bolts of the policy are being formulated. Likewise, there's an important role for Congress here, particularly in um, not just in your oversight role, but also in the funding of American democracy assistance programs. Make sure that religious freedom explicitly is being uh, funded much more than it has been. It's been funded in just some token ways in the, in the la last few years. Um, 
Here, here's one I might go a little bit more out on the limb. Uh, one of the policy implications here is, is choosing sides in, the, in these transitions. I think that uh, overall, as a general principle, the U.S. government should offer explicit and generous support to any parties and candidates in any of these transition countries who will embrace the twin tolerations and who are willing to accept U.S. support. That always has to be a, a cardinal principle, and Tamara can share with us some of the, uh, uh, some of the guidelines in place there. Uh, again, the, the perennial debate is if American support is going to some parties and not others, does that taint those parties as stooges of the West? Isn't that, that, that's always going to be a risk. Is there going to be blowback to them? Uh, I think uh, if they're willing to accept the support, if they seek it out, by and large, the, 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 the gains outweigh the costs, especially realizing that there really isn't a level playing field in a lot of these places. Uh, the Gulf Arabs especially are pouring a lot of petrodollars in to fund some of the more extremist Islamist parties. Uh, so we need to make sure that the more prog progressive pluralist parties, I won't say secularist, but pluralist ones, uh, have uh, uh, financial support as well. Um, so, uh, and then finally, I'll just say, uh, thinking about the, the, the big picture here, um, I still, you know, for all the twists and turns the still unfolding Arab Spring, Arab uprising has, has, take, has taken, I'm still in the long term, a uh, long run, an optimist. If we look at the last 50, 60 years since colonialism of this region, uh, there have been, you know, past failed narratives that uh, have, you know, taken hold for a while but haven't delivered uh, a better life for the people of the region. There's Arab nationalism uh, under, under, under uh, Nasser in the 50s and 60s into the early 70s. Uh, did, did, you know, did, didn't work. Uh, Islamism was the next uh, sort of you know animated ide ideology that had a lot of attraction. But we've seen how at the end of the day it veers uh, too much into into nihilism. Uh, one would hope that Islamic democracy could be a real animating principle for the for the whole region, especially if places like Turkey continue on a positive path and if Tunisia can succeed. Thank you. Thanks very very much, Will. Well, uh, we've already heard some references to Tamara Witties. Now we will hear, uh, hear from uh, Tamara Witties. It's, uh, it's a, a delight to have Tamara Witties, who probably is already known to, to everybody in the room. She really was in the eye of the storm uh, during um, the Arab Spring. Uh, uh, Dr. Witties served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs uh, from November of 2009 to January 2012, therefore for really the entire first year. Uh, of the Arab Spring. Uh, she coordinated U.S. policy on democracy and human rights uh, in the Middle East uh, for the State Department. Uh, she also oversaw the Middle East Partnership Initiative, which we've heard reference to, MEPI, uh, and served as Deputy Special Coordinator for Middle East Transitions. Uh, she's the author of Freedom's Unsteady March, America's Role in Building Arab Democracy, published by Brookings in 2008. And currently, she is the director a uh, new director uh, just uh, from a couple of months ago of the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. It's great to have you, Dr. Witties. Um, well, thanks so much. Uh, it is really a treat to, uh, to uh, be back um, in this world of intellectual engagement and, uh, and to sit on a panel with such a fantastic group of, of scholars and colleagues. Uh, and I really want to thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is especially timely for, for me to engage in, in this conversation with all of you um, because as part of uh, my, my new role in uh, running the Saban Center, we, we do an annual conference in Doha uh, called the U.S. Islamic World Forum, which um, began in the wake of 9-11 as an effort to um, build understanding between uh, various uh, sectors of American society and um, Muslim majority communities, but we're actually uh, focusing in this year on uh, what we're calling a long conversation around the theme of uh, citizenship, religion, and the state. And so for me, this is perfectly timed. Um, uh, a lot of uh, comments from the previous panelists about Tunisia as a model, to what extent Tunisia can be a model, to what extent did the U.S. Uh, government think of Tunisia as a model or invest in Tunisia as a model. And so I feel like I should begin with just, without getting too far off our, our main topic here, um, with, a, with a couple of data points on that, just to answer the, the questions that have been raised, um, which is that I, I think very much uh, Tunisia is seen as, as a central um, as a central locale, uh, as, a, as a focal point for um, the future of the of the Arab awakening and the prospects for democracy in the region. And I have to note that Secretary Clinton's visit there 
This spring was her second visit since the revolution. In fact, she was there last March, March 2011, and uh, my boss in the nearest affairs bureau, Jeff Feltman, was there the, the week after Ben Ali left the country. Um, and, and Tunisia's been, was a significant focus, I think remains a significant focus. In fact, the first wave of U.S. assistance into Tunisia in the wake of the revolution, this was a country where we had a bilateral economic program of $2 million in 2010. Um, the first wave of economic assistance was from MEPI. We basically threw out our budget, reallocated it, and uh, devoted a third of it, over $20 million, to Tunisia within weeks of the revolution. And over the course of last year, I think the administration overall put, put forward more than $50 million in assistance in the previous budget year, uh, along with loan guarantees, which would allow the Tunisian government to borrow on private markets several hundred million dollars. So that's all before you get the hundred million dollars that was recently announced. Whether that's enough, I don't know, uh, but I think it demonstrates uh, within budget constraints, um, and unfortunately, as you noted, the domestic politics of foreign aid, uh, a significant level of investment. Let me, uh, let me get to our sort of core topic here and make, I think, um, three or four main points. The first is, is specific to the case, to the Tunisian case. I think Alan, his article, does a tremendous job of laying out some of the key factors that seem to contribute to the success of the transition in Tunisia. And I, I, I can't disagree with any of that. I think that's all... Um, insightful. I guess I would raise a, a couple of questions about things that might be additional factors that are more case specific. And I would be really interested in your thoughts, Al, on these. The, the first is, um, the first gets to the question of the uncertainty uh, within which political actors make decisions about what they're willing to compromise on. And it seems to me that one of the really striking facts about Nahda in Tunisia is that it knew it had a lot of strength in society, but because it had been exiled for as long as it had, it didn't know how strong it was going to be. It, it surmised. Many people surmised. Um, but the size and strength of its organization, how much was still there from what had been there in, in the 1989 elections when they did so well, was unknown. And as a result, they couldn't count on it. They couldn't press their case. Uh, and the others uh, thought that maybe they had a, an advantage on certain issues or, or in certain ways. And I think that degree of uncertainty about the relative strength of this big Islamist party helped facilitate the compromise. Um, the other question that I think is worth looking at that might have more comparative application is about the military versus the police. Um, and this is a little bit of Egypt versus Tunisia, too. The Egyptian regime was rooted in the military. The Tunisian regime of Ben Ali was rooted in the police and the interior ministry. And in fact, the military had been <coughs> somewhat marginalized politically and budgetarily in a lot of other ways. It had its own grievances against the Ben Ali regime, which facilitated its decision not to shoot uh, and, and to ask Ben Ali to leave. And I think that... Um, I think that the fact that it was an interior ministry-based regime actually not only facilitated the, the removal uh, of the authoritarian, but it also meant that when the military came into this role, they were completely unprepared. It was not something they'd ever contemplated for themselves. If they had intended to play a political role, that wasn't something that had any legitimacy in society. And so it wasn't something they could really seriously think about, OK, are we going to be a, a is this going to be a military coup? Whereas in Egypt, uh, not only did they have that political legacy, if you will, but they also had, because of their close association with the regime, all kinds of vested interests that they wanted to protect. And so I think the calculations were uh, different and worth examining. Um, a second point really picks up on what Will was saying about early intervention. And I, I found in your article, Al, the most striking insight by far was your discussion of these early efforts at dialogue and political compromise amongst the, the parties um, well before any possibility of democratic transition. Uh, and indeed, when they had no, no hope that there would be um, an opportunity to implement these understandings. 
And so how do you understand these efforts? What drove them to do this in the first place? Uh, it's an interesting question, and I think one worth asking for the reasons Will cites, but particularly because we know that the pressures that drove the Tunisian Revolution, the Egyptian Revolution, the uprisings we saw across the rest of the region, we know that those demographic, those economic, those social pressures exist in every country in the Arab world. There is no country in the region that is immune from those drivers. And that was the thesis of my 2008 book. Um, but, if, but if that's the case, then we need to anticipate the need for this kind of political bargaining mm -hmm. to take place in other societies. And we should hasten, I would say, <laughs> not only agree with Will, but add urgency. We should hasten to try and facilitate this. But understanding what are the intrinsic motivations for these parties to engage in such a bargaining process, mm -hmm. that's crucial. I don't think we can top down this. Um, and I think, in fact, if you look at you know, some of the efforts over the past year, whether it's the Libyan case or the Syrian case, it's actually quite difficult to do from the outside, even when the incentive is strong. So understanding the intrinsic motivators, I think, is, is going to be essential to success. Um, and this, this issue of early intervention, I think, really hit home for me, particularly because one of the things that we faced as we were dealing with the, the, the outcomes on the ground over the last year uh, in terms of how the administration was working to respond was an understanding of the need for deliberative process, but at the same time, on the ground, tremendous pressure for speed in moving the political transition process forward. A lot of impatience at the popular level. Uh, and so political elites, while they were still trying to figure out, oh, you know, how am I positioned? What's to my advantage? What kind of electoral system would work well for me? They felt tremendous pressure to have elections as quickly as they could. And I think that this is something, this is something that's emerged in more recent democratic transitions not just in the Middle East, but elsewhere in the world, is sort of speeding up the calendar uh, versus the sort of more leisurely multi-year transitions that we've seen in, in earlier decades. And I, I would welcome your thoughts on, on that trend as well, because I wonder if it doesn't come at the expense of some of the groundwork that needs to take place in order for the outcomes to, to have the degree of consensus they need for stability. Um, Third point, I, I guess, um, is to what extent political actors in these circumstances, whether they're Islamist parties or others, are basing their views about what they want the ground rules to be, whether they're basing those, those views on lessons garnered from comparative experience, um, or what they believe will be to their best advantage given where they think they are positioned, what their relative political strength is. And you know, I, I think particularly of the Egyptian case and the incredible uh, lack of, of consensus around the issues of constitution first versus you know, presidency first or parliament first and all of those basic agenda setting uh, debates in Egypt uh, after the revolution. And it wasn't that people didn't understand the implications of those choices for the system, um, but it was that they really didn't know what was going to be to their advantage at any given moment. And in part because there was the military serving as power broker and arbitrator uh, to whom they could appeal, um, their evaluation of what was to their political advantage kept changing based on what they thought the military thought of them. Um, and I think one of the challenges uh, that we outsiders have as we confront these situations is the extent to which those comparative lessons can um, be integrated uh, at a moment when that jockeying for, for position is so intense. I think particularly uh, in the Egyptian case, too, of divisions that very quickly emerged amongst the revolutionaries within the, the various groups that made up the Revolutionary Youth Coalition, for example, incredible splits, or even within April 6th, splits over whether it was time to move from protest to political society. Um, in Tunisia, the, the civil society groups that were part of the revolution were eager 
to move into the role of power broker, political actor. Uh, and in the Egyptian case, in many cases, they really shunned that role, and some of them still do shun that role. Um, and it's interesting, it, it's not that there were no efforts at political compromise in Egypt. There were actually a lot of efforts. They all failed. <laughs> um, and, and so why did they fail? Uh, in some cases, I think it's because they weren't inclusive. Some of them deliberately were not inclusive. Uh, in other cases, I think it was just intense mutual mistrust. And so uh, again, coming back to this notion of early intervention, if this is one of our main policy lessons uh, out of the analysis that you've done, and I think you know, there's a lot of agreement here on that point, how do we apply that um, in the face of mutual mistrust? Finally, on the US role, um, I think we have to think about Tunisia versus Egypt partly in terms of how is the US perceived? What role could the United States have played in those two cases? In Tunisia, where it was very clear to the population that we were not big supporters of the Ben Ali regime, despite having a military assistance program, a lot of counterterrorism cooperation, and so on, but we also um, upset that regime repeatedly with our statements on World Press Freedom Day or with criticism of specific human rights cases. There was no doubt in terms of our public stance where we were. Whereas in the Egyptian case, we had a much more uh, complicated, multifaceted relationship with the, with the regime that had gone on for several decades and that created a certain legacy that for the United States post-revolution, we, we all have to live with. Um, and, and so I think that creates a, a particular challenge. And, and then there's an additional layer when it comes to the issue of religious freedom. And while not disagreeing with anything you said, Will, about, or, or Dan, about the centrality of this concept uh, when it comes to uh, promoting prospects for, for democracy, I think it's very challenging for the United States to be seen engaging on this issue without being perceived on the ground as engaged in special pleading on behalf of Christian minorities. Yeah. It's just a fact. That's the way we're perceived. And so the challenge for us is, how do we engage effectively? Um, and what framework can we use for talking about issues of religious freedom that avoids that trap, if you will? And I think the way we tried to do it um, over the past year is to use the framework of pluralism. Uh, that a healthy democratic society rests on pluralism, uh, that pluralism is religious pluralism, it's pluralism in gender terms, it's pluralism in political terms and ethnic terms. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at MEPI's framework uh, for what it does, it has three P's, pluralism, participation, and prosperity. So all the religious freedom stuff is in the pluralism bucket. And, you know, and that means we have a sort of... Um, uh, um, a problem aligning our domestic politics and our foreign policy on how we deal with this issue. And I think the, the more honest we are about that, the better off we'll be. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dr. Witties. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we're going to hear from uh, my colleague, Tom Farr. You've already heard uh, a bit from uh, Tom. Tom has uh, had a long career in the Foreign Service. Um, and uh, now, as he mentioned, he is the uh, director of the Religious Freedom Project at the uh, Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, my colleague in the Religious Freedom Project. Uh, so, Tom, thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'm going to make this very brief so that we can uh, involve uh, the, the audience in our discussion. Um, I'm going to try to bring this back squarely to the question of religious freedom and U.S. religious freedom policy, which, by the way, I'm perfectly prepared, Al, to change to twin tolerations policy. In fact, <laughs> uh, we, we could change it from uh, the IRFA to the Twin Tolerations Act, uh, and of course that would change the uh, acronyms at the State Department, which would be a big problem, but we can, we can work that. If we think that something like twin tolerations, uh, a proxy for religious freedom, if you like or not, is necessary for democratic transitions in highly religious societies, I think there's evidence that that's the case, 
and as Dan Philpott, I think, has brought out quite nicely, necessary, probably necessary to the consolidation of democracy, which is to say, uh, to ensure that democracies stay democracies, that they last, that they yield their benefits to all their citizens, uh, and that they yield their benefits to their neighbors. Uh, we haven't talked about democratic peace theory, but it's out there. Democrat, democratic countries tend not to uh, be in conflict with other democratic countries. So it's yet another reason of a million good reasons why we should support not simply transitions to democracy, but successful democracies around the world, because it's in our interest to do so. If the twin tolerations or some aspect of it is necessary to the uh, achievement of vital American interests in the world, why do we not pay more attention to it? Not uh, with uh, metaphorical terms, forgive me, I think that's what pluralism is. It may be a metaphor for religious freedom, but it's not the same thing. Indeed, if religious freedom is offensive to uh, religious groups who think uh, that it is a uh, sort of a stalking horse for making the world safe for Christian missionaries, and I agree that it is, pluralism surely does not solve that problem. If you believe you're the only um, religion that uh, is properly associated with a given country or the only true religion, why in the world would you want pluralism? I don't think that solves the problem at all. I think the problem is solved as we've been talking about it today, and that is dealing with the fundamental functional problem of the relationship between religion and state. If you don't get that right, you can't have a democracy, and you can't have all the stuff that you want, whether you're secular, whether you're religious, if you want democracy. Now, if you're after something else, if you're after at the end of the day, one man, one vote, one time, a theocracy or a caliphate, or if this, if this is just a tactic to get to something else, then of course none of this helps us. And if, that's probably something we ought to talk about. But if we assume, as I think most here do on this panel, that these are countries that do seek stable democracy, then to me the question is why the United States has paid so little attention to what we'll call for now the twin tolerations. It has had for 12 going on 13 years, well, I guess going on 14 years now, since 1998, the International Religious Freedom Act, which mandates the promotion of religious freedom in our foreign policy. It has not, I think it is safe to say, under any of the administrations, including this one, been integrated into the way we look at our vital national interests. I think that it has been primarily an anti-persecution slash humanitarian kind of policy in which we look at the negatives, we put people on a list, uh, we give a few speeches, but we don't integrate this into the way that we promote democracy around the world.